the richest Romans were almost unimaginably wealthy. At a time when one Cistertius could buy two loaves of bread or four cups of wine, and 1,000 Cistertii was a decent middle-class income, we know of two Romans worth 400 million Cistertii, and those were just private citizens. The emperors and the great generals of the late Republic were incomparably richer. The wealthiest Romans discovered a dizzying array of ways to disperse, dissipate, and outright squander their fortunes. Some of the most spectacular involved feasting. A single four-pound red mullet, a small but delectable fish, could cost 1,200 sestertii, more, in other words, than most Romans made in a year. During the reign of Tiberius, three large mullets sold for 30,000 sestertii. Those with even more expensive tastes could serve songbirds to their guests, since a single small bird might retail for 6,000 sestertii, a full course would cost 100,000 or more. Such sums were almost routine for the most extravagant members of the Roman aristocracy. The mansion of the Epicure Lucullus, for example, contained a dining room where no meal was served that cost less than 200,000 sestertii. One of Nero's companions burned through 4 million sestertii, gathering enough roses to decorate a banquet hall in the dead of winter. Another profligate, possibly inspired by Cleopatra, dissolved a pearl worth a million sestertii in vinegar, drank it, and so enjoyed the taste that he took to serving a round of liquefied pearl to his dinner guests. The famous gourmand Apicius reportedly spent 100 million sestertii in his quest for the perfect dinner. The silverware at a Roman banquet matched the opulence of the food. During the reign of Claudius, one rich freedman owned a silver platter that weighed 500 pounds. The metal alone was worth nearly 200,000 sestertii and the craftsmanship more. The aristocratic commander of a legion in Germany carried silver dishes weighing 12,000 pounds wherever he went. Impressive though all this polished plate was, it paled beside Chinese silk, which was literally worth its weight in gold. Almost equally valuable was any fabric dyed purple, the imperial color. Even a cloak of light purple could cost 10,000 sestertii, and true purple cloth was so expensive that Marcus Aurelius once tried to balance the imperial budget by auctioning off garments from his wardrobe. Vast amounts were paid for Scythian emeralds and diamonds from India. One senator owned a ring with an opal valued at 2 million sestertii. An envious Mark Antony condemned the man to death and confiscated his ring. Julius Caesar once spent six million sestertii on a lustrous pearl for his mistress. The Roman elite showed a similar lack of restraint when furnishing their houses. A candelabrum from Greece might cost 50,000 sestertii, and an agate vase 300,000 or more. Nero owned a crystal cup worth a million. The same emperor's embroidered couch covers, imported from Parthia, cost four million. Cicero paid 500,000 sestertii for a sideboard of African citrus wood, and tables of the same material sold for up to three times as much. Although the most valuable paintings and sculptures of the Greek masters were monopolized by the emperors, many expensive antiques were privately owned. Some Romans collected memorabilia of famous philosophers. A lamp owned by the Stoic master Epictetus was sold for 12,000 sestertii, and a staff of the cynic Peregrinus Proteus otherwise notable for immolating himself at the Olympic Games, went for 24,000. The houses in which the Roman elite admired their antiques and staged their decadent dinners were among the most elaborate and expensive ever built. At a time when the annual rent of a decent apartment was around 500 sestertii, though in Rome, the New York City of antiquity, the average was closer to 2,000, members of the elite routinely lavished millions on their houses. In one Roman townhouse on the Palatine, the garden alone, shaded by six towering lotus trees, was valued at three million sesterti. By the reign of Tiberius, according to one author, any mansion that covered less than four acres was considered small. The atria and courtyards of these houses were forested with marble columns. The villa of the Gordians, just outside Rome, had a peristyle with 200 columns, each a monolith of rare and beautiful stone. More marble gleamed in the reception rooms, whose walls might be plated with silver 
or gilded bronze. Most wealthy Romans owned several houses. The most visible would be a townhouse in one of Rome's fashionable hilltop neighborhoods. The poet Marshall criticized a man who kept mansions on three of Rome's hills. Especially in the spring, much of the Roman elite retreated to seaside villas by the Bay of Naples. The 4th century senator Symmachus had no fewer than five villas by the bay, each a few miles from the next. In summer, to avoid the heat and malaria, they often decamped to airy villas in the countryside. Some moved even more frequently. Though only moderately wealthy for a senator, Cicero owned eight villas, along with a few lodges on the roads between his properties, so that he would never be forced to stay at a public inn. More decadence after a brief word about this video's sponsor. Exclusivity has always been a hallmark of high society, and not just in vacation homes. But now, thanks to today's sponsor, ordinary investors like you and I can access the most exclusive luxury market of all, fine art. Masterworks allows you to diversify your portfolio with blue-chip, million-dollar art for a fraction of its total value. They have over $800 million of art under management, and they have delivered on 15 exits, all of them profitable for their investors. As in any investment, of course, past performance does not guarantee future results, but it's easy to see why nearly 800,000 people have signed up so far. Since so many of you seem to be interested, Masterworks is extending your chance to skip the waitlist to get started, all you have to do is click the link in the description. See important disclosures at masterworks.com slash about slash disclosure. Returning to our topic. Villas were usually surrounded by carefully landscaped grounds. The orator Hortensius created an expansive wooded park around his favorite villa and filled it with animals that were trained to gather at the sound of a horn. Another villa built on the shore of a lake, featured artificial grottos and a purpose-built river teeming with fish. The villas of Lucullus on the Bay of Naples were famous for their elaborate fish ponds, connected to the sea by sluices and tunnels. The fish alone, sold after Lucullus' death, were worth four million sestertii. A small addition, such as a renovated bath, might cost nearly a million sestertii. The houses themselves were worth far more. Marius's villa at Mycenaeum, for example, went for 10 million, and Pompey sold a few of his estates for 70 million sestertii. Especially in the heart of Rome, the land over which these mansions sprawled was extremely valuable. Caesar reportedly spent 100 million sestertii simply buying the property on which his forum was constructed. During the late Republican era, a political career could be costlier than any estate. When Julius Caesar was edile, he provided games that featured 320 pairs of gladiators, among many other entertainments, at personal expense. One of his contemporaries constructed two wooden theaters that could pivot to join together, forming an amphitheater. Most extravagant of all was Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, who imported no fewer than 360 marble columns from Greece to decorate a temporary theater. Such gestures drove many ambitious politicians deeply into debt. At one point, Caesar himself reportedly owed more than 30 million sestertii to his creditors. A final way the Roman elite frittered away their fortunes was on their own funerals. When cremation was in vogue, their pyres were loaded with precious incense. The funeral procession of Sulla included a life-sized figure of the late lamented dictator with a lictor made from compressed incense and cinnamon. Nero reportedly burned more than a full year's crop of Arabian incense at the funeral of his wife, Popea. Incense was only part of the expense. Elite funerals were often accompanied by gladiatorial games and other entertainments. During the reign of Tiberius, the people of one Italian town refused to allow a man to bury his wealthy father until he had promised funerary games. Other men bestowed gigantic sums of money on their communities and their wills. Caesar, for example, bequeathed 300 sestertii to about a quarter million people. By that standard, the wealthy freedman, who stipulated in his will that his heirs were to spend 
one million one hundred thousand sesterii on his funeral was little short of thrifty. Tombs, with their surrounding gardens, might cover an acre or more. The funerary plot of a rich man in Gaul, which included a pond and orchard, had a permanent staff of four groundskeepers. The largest tombs, like the Pyramid of Castius or the Mausoleum of Caecilia Metella, were almost pharaonic in scale, fitting monuments to a life of excess. I have a new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines. More frequently asked questions about the ancient Greeks and Romans. It's a sequel to Naked Statues, Vac Gladiators, and War Elephants, and it's available for pre-order now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and through your local bookstore. If you're interested in more Told and Stone content, including my podcast, check out my channel, Told and Stone Footnotes. I also have a channel called Scenic Routes to the Past, which is dedicated to historically themed travel. You'll find both channels linked in the description. Last but not least, please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told and Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.